Well, good morning, and again, I'd like to welcome you all to the Subcommittee on Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection here on Energy and Commerce. And as I mentioned, uh, we have another subcommittee that's running right now, so we will have members coming back from the first floor upstairs uh, during the committee from one to the other. But again, I do uh, thank you all for being here today, and I will recognize myself for my five-minute opening statement. And again, uh, welcome to the subcommittee in today's Disruptor Series hearing examining uh, quantum computing. We continue our Disruptor Series as we examine emerging technologies supporting U.S. innovation and jobs. This, sub this, this morning, we are discussing the revolutionary technology, no technology known as quantum computing. This involves harnessing the power of physics at its most basic level. Unlike the computers we are familiar with we use today, a quantum computer holds, a, holds the potential to be faster and more powerful. This innovation is expected to change every industry and make problems that are impossible to solve today something that can be solved in a matter of days or weeks. Efforts to develop a commercially available and practical quantum computer are being pursued around the world. Because of the tremendous costs involved in developing a suitable environment for a quantum computer to operate, many of these efforts involve government support. Both the European Union and China have pledged or already have spent billions to develop a quantum computer. In the United States, development of quantum computer is proceeding at the academic, governmental, and private sectors. In addition to larger and familiar technology uh, companies, smaller startups are also leading efforts in this area. We're fortunate to have one of these startups, IonQ, to testify today. Although a quantum computer holds a tremendous potential to solve previously non-computable problems, there are skeptics who question whether it will be possible ever to develop such technology. We look forward to our witnesses giving us their thoughts on this question. On the other hand, some fear that the threat such a computer would pose to a traditional computing model. Especially when it comes to encryption and data security, some fear that a quantum computer would make it nearly impossible to keep future computers secure. Data security and consumer privacy are key concerns of this committee. We also look forward to our witnesses addressing this issue as well. Quantum computers hold tremendous potential to help solve problems involving the discovery of new drugs, developing more efficient supply chains and logistics operations, searching massive volumes of data, and developing artificial intelligence. Whichever nation first develops a practical quantum computer will have a tremendous advantage over its foreign peers. We hope our witnesses will help us examine the state of the race to develop a quantum computer and how the United States is doing in that race. This is obviously a very dense subject. We, are, we also understand there are several other areas under development leveraging the principle of quantum mechanics. Our goal today is simple, to develop a better understanding of the, po the, the potential of quantum computers, the obstacles to developing this technology, and what policymakers should be doing to remove barriers and help spur innovation, competition, and ensure a strong and prepared workforce for future jobs. As we explore this topic today, I would again like to thank our witnesses for coming to share their expertise on this very complicated and revolutionary technology, and I again appreciate you all being here today. And at this time, I will yield back my time and uh, recognize the general lady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes. Well, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. We continue our disruptor series with exploration of quantum computing. Um, I want to congratulate all of you for being so smart. Um, <laughs> I, I was Dr. Franklin, I was just told that I think it was your mother and I graduated from the University of Illinois about the same time. This was a time before we knew anything about computers, really. It was just beginning. Um, and here you are today, the next generation uh, leading us into, uh, into the future. So I appreciate all of you uh, being here today. This technology, I understand, is still in the research phase, but the potential applications are tremendous, from healthcare to energy efficiency and everything in between. Given this potential, global competitors from the European Union to China are rushing to invest in quantum computing. The U.S. must make strategic investments if it wants to stay ahead. And those investments really start with STEM education. We must encourage students, including young women and students of color, 
to pursue interests in computer science and physics, fostering curiosity today prepares young, young minds to become great innovators of tomorrow. As, form as a former teacher myself, I strongly believe that our future economic success depends on investing in our children's education. Our research universities are leading the way on quantum computing. Public investment is crucial to develop technology until it can be profitable, profitably deployed in the private sector. However, the federal government has so far failed to provide robust, reliable investment in quantum computing. The lack of investment in STEM education and research speaks to the misguided priorities of this Republican Congress. While wealthy shareholders get most of the gain from a $2 trillion Republican tax bill, Congress is underinvesting in students and research institutions. We fund tax cuts for the rich at the expense of our future prosperity. Now that Congress has passed a budget agreement, we have the chance to make some of the investments that our country so desperately needs. But instead of embracing the opportunity to advance bipartisan appropriations bills, the Republican majority plans to bring up a rescission bill to pull back funding for children's health insurance programs and other programs. Um, and today, we will be voting on a bill to literally take food out of the mouths of families. We need to get our priorities straight. The U.S. can be a global leader in quantum computing and other groundbreaking technologies, but only if we prioritize investment for our futures, for our future uh, over tax cuts for the, the wealthy. I, uh, I look forward to hearing from our panel about the promise of quantum computing. I'll try my best to follow what you're telling me and the challenges that we face in developing this technology. <clears throat> I'm especially proud to welcome Professor Diana Franklin from the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago is one of the leaders in quantum computing research, and I'm eager to hear more about this work. So thank you, Chairman Latta, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The general lady yields back. Uh, Chairman, uh, the full committee has not made it in yet. Is there anyone on the Republican side wishing to claim his time? If not, uh, at this time, um, that will conclude the members' opening statements and uh, get to the real meat of the issue today that we want to hear about. And I won't tell you how long ago, uh, Madam uh, uh, Ranker, how long when I took uh, computer science in college. I probably shouldn't say this. We used punch cards yeah, and, tel and, tel and teletype machines. Uh, so <laughs> it was a bad, bad Saturday morning. Went back to the computer science department, and uh, you were expecting us about that much and came back with that much and you made a mistake. But I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today and we're really looking forward to this, uh, your testimony today. And our, our witnesses will uh, have an opportunity to make five minute opening statements. And our witnesses today are, da are Dr. Matthew Putman, founder of CEO of Nanotronics, Dr. Christopher Monroe, chief scientist and founder of IonQ and professor of physics at the University of Maryland. Dr. Diana Franklin, Professor and Director of Computer Science at the University of Chicago, and uh, Mr. Michael Brett, CEO of Q Branch. And so again, we appreciate you being here today. And Dr. Putman, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Just if you would just press that uh, microphone and pull it close to you and we'll get started. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ch uh, Chairman Lada, Congresswomen and Congressmen. Nanotronics does not make quantum computers. We're in the enablers of technologists and companies that with us strive to revolutionize the way information can be transformed. We've provided some of the world's largest companies and smaller entrepreneurial innovators with the tools of modern computation and imaging. We work with those that build the most advanced materials and microelectronics. Nanotronics achieves this in the only way we see feasible for the continued exponential progression of technology, which is through artificially intelligent factories. Quantum computing not only promises to break the barriers of encryption, it also breaks some fundamental barriers to human progress. Many of our greatest achievements have been characterized in terms of competition and races. Often, a technological race 
appears to be a war of ideologies or of business dominance. With quantum computing, there's an even greater by battle, the fight against physical scarcity. There are three areas that we must work together on to win, not only for our nation, but for humanity. Agriculture, the new fertilizers can feed the increasing population of the world while maintaining diversity of crops. Drug discovery, by being able to simulate and produce molecules faster and with greater precision than are possible by traditional means. This will not only lead to cures for diseases, but reduce the often financially restrictive experimentation and trials that are required to make even incremental improvements in treatment. Materials for power devices from batteries to solar cells. These have been studied for decades, but in many respects, the United States is still early on in this journey. Companies are moving with speed, and with national support, it's possible that quantum computing can soon reach an inflection point. The race to achieve a workable quantum computer that can reduce scarcity to this level requires greater national attention than has currently been realized by either the vast majority of companies or of the country as a whole. The steps to enabling quantum computing will need to involve, one, an effort that funds the creation of factories for new quantum chips. A semiconductor fab for classical computers can cost as much as $20 billion. To a large extent, these fabs are not being built in the United States. We have an opportunity to acknowledge and to change this trend by leading the way in the construction of factories for this next generation of powerful computing. Two, artificial intelligence. While quantum computing itself will increase the capabilities of artificial intelligence, the ability to design materials and software for quantum computers themselves will come through the interaction of human and computer agents. Understanding such key elements as component design, fabrication conditions, and the number of qubits needed requires collaboration of humans and machines. The number of qubits in a quantum computer is directly related to the number of calculations. A 10 qubit quantum computer can produce 1,000 calculations, and a 30 qubit quantum computer can produce 1 billion. Millions of qubits are required to achieve the full potential of quantum computing. This exponential growth in qubit to calculations is beyond the reach of factories as they are. Without the advanced tools of AI for controlling factories, a truly useful quantum computer may not be possible. Three, education. We need to develop the expertise required for the multidisciplinary nature of quantum computer science. It's physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer science, and application curiosity and expertise are all necessary. We cannot work in isolation. We need to embrace immigration and welcome strong talent from around the world with expertise in these areas. When we look towards the future, we can see it as a battle of ideologies, of resources, or of technologies. Quantum computers encompass all of these to some extent. Quantum mechanics is the basis of universal behavior at the smallest scales, but affects the largest of matter. It's therefore not surprising that harnessing this physical property has such far-reaching implications. Because of this, it's important that we view it with the powerful associations that it warrants, with the weight of risk in a fractured world or of great rewards in a unified one. As we move forward, we see how quantum computing lets us scale in ways that meet not only the needs of industry, but of our country and the world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for, Marie, for your testimony this morning. And Dr. Monroe, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be here uh, for this committee's disruptor series on quantum computing. Uh, I'm a quantum physicist uh, at the University of Maryland and also a, a co founder and chief scientist at INQ, which is a startup company that aims to build and manufacture small quantum computers. I've also worked with the National Photonics Initiative, uh, which is a collaborative alliance among industry, academic, 
uh, and academics uh, with the interest in developing quantum technology. Um, and uh, with the National Photonics Initiative, we have uh, promoted the idea of a national quantum initiative. Uh, and there is pending legislation uh, in, in the House Science that's coming up in the House Science Committee. Um, so I have uh, about one minute to, to define what quantum computers are, and I, I, uh, I think I can get, uh, get to some of the basics. Um, we know that information is stored in bits, zeros or ones. Uh, the fundamental difference in quantum information, it's stored in quantum bits or qubits. These can be both zero and one at the same time, uh, as long as you don't look. And then at the end of the day, you look and it, it randomly assumes one of the values. But as long as you don't look, there's a potential for massive parallelism. As you add qubits, you get exponential storage capacity. Um, and because quantum computers only work while you're not looking, it involves quite uh, revolutionary and even exotic hardware to realize this. Individual atoms, uh, that's the technology we use at INQ, superconducting circuits that are kept at very low temperatures, other, uh, uh, other competing platforms uh, uh, involve that type of technology. It's, it's very exotic stuff. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think within the next several years, we are going to see small quantum computers with up to about 100 quantum bits, which sounds pretty small. But even with 100 quantum bits, uh, it can, in a sense, deal with information that uh, eclipses that of all the hard drives in the world. And on our way to a million qubits, where we can do uh, new problems that uh, conventional qubit computers could never tackle, we need to build the small ones first. Uh, so in terms of quantum applications, uh, I would say uh, it falls roughly into three categories. There are strong overlaps. Um, in the short term, quantum sensors can enhance sensitivity to certain measurements that could impact navigation, in a, maybe in a GPS-blind environment, and also remote sensing. In the medium term, uh, quantum communication networks may allow the transmission of information that can be provably secure, because remember, quantum information only exists when nobody looks at it. If somebody looks at it, it changes, and that can make uh, communication inherently secure. Uh, in the long term, probably the most disruptive technology are quantum computers. Um, and quantum computers are not just more powerful computers. They are radically different. They may allow us to solve problems that could never, ever be solved using classical computers. These involve optimization routines that could impact logistics, uh, economic and financial modeling, and uh, also the design of new materials and uh, molecular function that could uh, impact the health sciences and drug delivery, for instance. Uh, and even longer term, quantum computers could be used to, uh, to do decryption, breaking of popular uh, codes. So there's a security aspect to everything uh, that quantum information touches. Um, now, the challenges are, are, uh, are pronounced in this field. Uh, there's, there, there are a few issues, one involving a workforce and one involving the marketplace. Uh, the workforce issue is that universities uh, are, are chock full of students and faculty that are comfortable with quantum physics, and we do research in the area, but we don't build things that can be used by somebody that doesn't want to or need to know all the details. Whereas industry makes those things, but they don't have a quantum engineering workforce. The marketplace is also a challenge because we don't know exactly what the killer app for quantum, quantum computers in particular will be. So uh, we have promoted the idea of a national quantum initiative uh, that would establish uh, several uh, 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 large and focused hub labs throughout the country and other components as well, including a user access program for existing quantum computers. Um, it is imperative that the U.S. Uh, retain its leadership in this technological frontier. As we, as we heard from the chairman, uh, there, is, there is concerted efforts in Europe, and in particular China, uh, that, is, that is spending lots of very focused uh, uh, investments in, in this field. So in conclusion, uh, quantum technology is coming, and the U.S. should lead in this next generation of sensors, computers, and communication networks. The National Quantum Initiative provides a framework for implementing a comprehensive uh, quantum initiative across the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak on quantum technology and the need for a nationally focused effort to advance quantum information science and technology in the U.S. Well, thank you very much. And Dr. Franklin, you're recognized in five minutes. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Schakowsky. I'm honored to be here before you in the committee to offer testimony on the promise of quantum technology, the important role universities must play to realize commercialization, and the biggest challenges we're facing in doing so. In my dual roles as Compu Director of Computer Science Education at UChicago STEM Ed and a Research Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Chicago, I research emerging technologies and computer science education. As lead investigator for quantum education for the EPIC quantum computing project in the NSF Expeditions and Computing Program, it is my mission to design and implement educational initiatives at K-12, university, and professional venues to develop a quantum computing workforce. Quantum computing could be a game changer in promising areas including drug design and food production. By accelerating research time to develop drugs, critical federal research and Medicaid dollars could be saved along with improved quality of life. Unlocking the secrets of nitrogen fixation through quantum simulation could vastly reduce the energy costs of fertilizer production and thus food production throughout the world. While the university has historically been on the forefront of computer science and emerging technologies, lapses in academic funding for quantum computer science have allowed global competitors to make great strides, putting the U.S. back 10 years from where it could have been in research output and workforce development. In the past 17 years since the inception of quantum computer science, distinguished from quantum physics and algorithm, developed, algorithm development, academic funding has only been available for eight of these years, lead, leading to only 10 PhD students being trained rather than a potential of almost 200 students and no meaningful education programs aimed at this area. As research groups came and went with the funding, postdocs were laid off and graduate students were transitioned to conventional computer science fields. Yet universities are critical to commercialization. While companies work individually and compete against each other to produce proprietary tools, academics produce results and tools that all companies can use and improve upon, as well as train experts who can work at companies. They're both necessary for the commercialization of quantum computing. The challenge of bringing quantum computers to the point of usefulness cannot be underestimated, both in building reliable machines and writing software. Professor Christ Christopher Monroe talks about knows extensive expertise in the former. I am here to talk about the increasingly important role that computer scientists must take. Historical funding in theoretical software and quantum devices has created a chasm between the software, which assumes large, perfect hardware, and real hardware that is small and unreliable at this point. NSF has rec recently recognized this issue, supplementing their hardware initiative Quantum Leap with a stack program that requires an interdisciplinary team that works to bridge this gap. One gap is in software development. There is a difference between a quantum algorithm and software that can solve a particular problem. Bridging this gap requires interdisciplinary teams such as exist at QX branch. Deep expertise is necessary to figure out how to modify software that works in one specific context to another, much more so in quantum computing than in traditional computing. If this were furniture construction, what we have right now is piles of wood, screws, and nails. An expert needs to figure out how to use those to create useful furniture. Instead, what we want in the future is for non-experts to be able to go to quantum IKEA, get a prefabbed kit, and easily modify it for their application. This exists for classical computing, but not for quantum computing. Another gap is between software and hardware. Current algorithms are written for perfect hardware, but hardware on the horizon is very error prone. We're on a journey to that perfect hardware, but we're not there yet. It's like if you meticulously planned for a to prepare a gourmet meal for 10. But when you arrived, there were only supplies for six, and you could only use the kitchen for two hours prior to the meal. You would need to adjust your plans. Current, quantum current and quantum computers that are on the horizon can only sustain computations for a limited time, and they're very small. Some modifications can be automated. However, for more advanced modifications, the plan needs to be rethought. Thus, some of the specific hardware limitations, like the specific ways in which different technologies tend to introduce errors, need to be communicated to the programmers so they can figure out how to adjust their applications. In order to realize quantum computing, federal funding needs to be, first and foremost, consistent, directed at not just building hardware and developing algorithms, but to interdisciplinary teams that include applications developers and computer scientists spread across a range of agencies with different missions like NSF, DARPA, DOE, and DOD, directed not just at technology development, but to workforce development, so that there are more people available to write applications and to perform the engineering work at these companies, and above all, supporting the K-12 STEM pipeline to train the next generation of innovators. With a significant investment in hardware, software, and workforce development, 
I am confident the United, United States can maintain its dominance in computing. This concludes my remarks. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with subcommittee members, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Brett, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Schakowsky and members of this committee. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to participate in today's hearing and discuss the opportunities and challenges presented by quantum computing. My name is Michael Brett. I'm the CEO of a company called QBranch. We're an advanced data analytics company based here in Washington, DC, but also with teams in Australia and the UK. We're a fast growing team of data scientists, software engineers, and machine learning specialists who design algorithms for challenging data problems. We're at the cutting edge of creating algorithms that find patterns, detect anomalies, and uncover other business insights that help our customers reduce their costs and serve their customers better. <coughs> data analytics is already a rapidly advancing technology area delivering benefits to people all over the world, but we're particularly excited about what quantum computing can do for our business. As we've heard, quantum computers are not just a faster computer. They enable an entirely different approach to performing calculations. In the realm of quantum physics, there are some incredible and surprising phenomena that, if harnessed, could allow us to solve some interesting and practically unsolvable problems. Problems like simula simulating the interaction between molecules, as, as these molecules grow in size, the computational cost grows exponentially larger. Our friends who build quantum computing hardware are in the process of creating machines that take advantage of these unique phenomena. And you heard a great example from Chris Munro this morning at RNQ. These machines allow us as software developers uh, to solve difficult problems using a different kind of mathematics, quantum math, much more efficiently than we ever could on classical computers. And our ambition is simple. Quantum computers will allow us to solve some of the most intractable and also the most valuable computational problems that exist today. These new quantum solutions will benefit Americans in ways they might not ever be aware of. Globally, the race is on to apply quantum computing to problems in transport, energy production, health science and pharmacology, uh, finance and insurance, defense and national security. And we want our applications to be the first apps in a quantum app store. Looking forward to the kind of quantum computers that are likely to be commercially available over the next decade, there are broadly three classes of application that become possible in the near term. The first are optimization problems like logistics and transport routing, financial portfolio optimization. The second is in machine learning where we can accelerate some of the most computationally expensive parts of training in artificial intelligence uh, to detect patterns in large and complex data sets. And the third is in chemical simulation, where we can use a quantum computer to simulate the behavior of molecules and materials and design uh, new processes around that. Across these three applications, the potential value to everyday citizens is immense. And let me give you a concrete example of where this could apply. QBranch com recently completed a study into quantum computing applications with Merck, the pharmaceutical company. We worked together to design a quantum algorithm and test it on today's available hardware uh, to look at, a, at an approach at optimizing the production of a particular drug. And the particular drug that they're interested in has an extremely challenging production optimization uh, process involved. And quantum computing gave us the tools to look at the manufacturing process in an entirely different way that could radically change the, the efficiency of creating this drug and delivering value to the consumer. It's an application such as this that we're focused on at QBranch. Breakthroughs enabled by a new approach in computing that allow us to change the way we think about business and manufacturing processes. There are some challenges ahead though in realizing this technology and the federal government can help us create the environment for industry to lead. The three biggest challenges I'd like to highlight today are first, the skills and workforce. As we've heard, if we're to be successful at bringing quantum computing to market, we need a highly skilled, multidisciplinary, diverse workforce with core skills in quantum information science, computer science, data analytics, machine learning, and AI, combined with domain expertise in finance, pharmaceuticals, energy, and other industries. And we need American universities to send us graduates with these skills. The second is an in international cooperation. As American companies compete in this emerging ecosystem, we will achieve our fullest success through international cooperation. There's valuable scientific research and engineering development that's being made elsewhere, including in key allies such as Australia, the UK, Canada, Japan, and Singapore. We need to be able to access the best talent and technology globally, and this means partnering. There will be national security considerations for this technology, of course, 
But if export restrictions are applied prematurely or without due consideration, it will stifle commercial innovation. <clears throat> Finally, we need to maximize and leverage private sector investment into this technology area. Over the past 18 months, we've seen an incredible acceleration in corporate R&D and venture capital that's flown into this technology. It's an exciting time, but I must stress that we're just at the beginning of this technology development. And the government can maximize and leverage this investment through targeted federal funding and coordination to reduce the gaps and overlaps in R&D and help accelerate the technology. So in closing, I would like to reiterate my appreciation for the opportunity to join you today and share a little about what we're doing at QBranch and quantum computing. This subcommittee is addressing important issues that will help bring quantum computing to commercial reality and give us a powerful new tool to create valuable software. And again, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate all your testimony this morning, and that will conclude our witnesses' uh, testimony this morning, and uh, we'll begin our questioning from the members. And I'll open in with a uh, uh, questions with five minutes, and pardon my allergies this morning, it's this, this time of the year in Washington. Uh, you know, first, I, I really appreciated uh, reading your testimony last night, and a lot, a lot of questions in five minutes. But if I, if I could start, uh, Dr. Putman, with you, if I may, because it was, I really uh, was interested when you said what impact uh, quantum computer would have on manufacturing in the United States, because like in my district, I have a unique district, I have 60,000 manufacturing jobs, and I also have the largest farm income producing district in the state of Ohio. And in your opening statement, you had mentioned about on the manufacturing side, you talked about uh, on the, on the, on with drugs and agriculture, energy. And uh, this, com this committee deals a lot with all that, not with really on the agricultural side, but uh, I was really interested in that. And uh, I'd like to know, uh, especially what the impact would be on manufacturing, and also, am I correct that it would both create new opportunities while uh, disrupting those existing industries that are out there today? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Chairman Lada, my fellow Ohioan. Um, this is, of course, extremely personal to me as well, um, being from Ohio and being from, you know, creating and trying to enable manufacturing work. What's important, I think, about your question is that these are brand new industries. It's not just about disrupting current industries, it's about creating jobs that are for the next generation of technologies. And this is building, I think, interesting jobs as well for technologists of the future. And that goes through entire large factories. I mentioned the cost of a fab. It's not just the cost of building a fab, we'd like to bring down the cost to build fabs. It's the opportunity for workers um, to be working with the latest of technologies. Um, I think that the Midwest and the rest of the country as a whole can only benefit from this. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Monroe, uh, what changes would be, would be needed to ensure America has that workforce that is ready for quantum computing revolution? And we've been hearing from the witnesses, you know, we have to have that workforce out there and the training. So how do, how do we get to that point? Do we need to, you know, on the educational side, especially at the university levels, do we need universities that would be specialized that in, in, uh, in the field, or what, what do we need to do? Well, uh, uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Lada. The, there, there are a number of uh, things that we can do as a country to foster this, this, this gap, this connection between university and government laboratory research and, uh, as I said, in industrial production. And at the university side, um, I'm sorry to say that most e engineering and computer science uh, departments haven't really embraced this field, as, as Dr. Franklin mentioned. I think why, why not? Uh, well, I, I have my own, uh, my own thoughts on that. I think, uh, actually, my daughter is a computer science major at University of Maryland, and uh, the computer science departments, the, the students, um, are keen to get a high-paying job right after they graduate. Uh, quantum computing, uh, not that it's not a high-paying job, but it's, it's a very speculative field, and it's, uh, it, it, it's hard to identify exactly what the marketplace is. Um, and I think uh, computer science departments and engineering departments uh, uh, I think they have not embraced this field as much as the sciences have, uh, and I think that is changing at, at some places. My, my university, at, uh, University of Maryland, is one of those. Chicago is another. There are several across the country that have done that, but it's it's not widespread. Uh, many of these departments won't hire faculty that are doing research in this field, and I think Dr. Franklin mentioned the National Science Foundation has taken an active role in trying to change that by uh, by instituting new grant programs 
that foster the development of quantum computer science, for instance. So that's on the university side. Um, on the industry side, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a tough nut to crack because this new technology, as I mentioned, uh, involves very exotic types hardware that industry ha doesn't have so much experience with. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it reminds me of in, in history in the 50s when semiconductor uh, devices were being developed and scaled the people who did this over the many decades that gave rise to Moore's Law, including Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, uh, these were not vacuum tube engineers who, who had uh, instituted the previous generation of computers. So it takes time, um, and it takes, uh, it takes risk, and it takes uh, 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 funding from, uh, from these corporations to do that. Well, thank you very much. And my time is about to expire, so I'm going to yield back and recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. <coughs> Starting to uh, understand the uh, much used phrase, taking a quantum leap, um, because really what you're talking about is, of all the things I think we've heard about, the most uh, disruptive in a good way and in a challenging way um, to um, the, the, the future. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to talk to Dr. Franklin, <coughs> things I think I, I know more about, which is about education. And I do want to hear about more about EPIC and the things that, that, that you're doing. But first, I, I want to hear about your efforts with younger students um, in a minute. But I, I want to first hear about what's happening at the graduate and undergraduate level. Um, you know, what I'm hearing really from all of you is that workforce capacity is really a challenging issue. Um, and if we're going to be competitive and if we're going to keep up with countries that are making and the, the EU and, and also China, then we need to get serious about making these uh, public investments. Um, but I'm wondering if you can um, talk to me a little bit about the urgent need. Yes. So I think um, Dr. Monroe mentioned that computer science hasn't had as much quantum in it. And I think it all comes back to those funding lapses because our group what and other groups started and they the way courses get created is that graduate students get trained in a field. They go out and become professors, create classes and train more students. Those students need to be able to have jobs in order to make it worth it for them to take those courses. If you if no federal funding, if, if a program gets canceled in year two of six, and all of the federal funding goes away and the graduate students get put in other fields, you're not going to have an education program. And so that's what's happened twice, is that the federal funding went completely away for, for the computer science portion of quantum computing. And so groups that were active and getting into the field left the field. Um, and so now with this new stack funding and the new EPIC program that we have, um, we are planning educational initiatives at all levels, including tutorials at, um, for professionals. We have a tutorial in June and a tutorial in October um, for, for professors and graduate students who are already in the field who want to transition to quantum computing. Um, there's an initiative in the, uh, in the Institute for Molecular Engineering at UChicago um, that has an undergraduate degree with a quantum track. We're partnering with them to create some computer science to add to that hardware track. Um, and there's a program Is that, that the quantum uh, engineering degree. Yes, that you're talking about. Okay. There's a quantum track of the molecular engineering degree. Yes, and there's also they also have a program to embed graduate students that are working in all areas of quantum with uh, commercial with companies. And so we are particip participating in that. So we're trying to train other research groups so that they can start doing research in quantum. Um, you know, give, g given the, the potential, it seems to me that we have to have some sort of almost like a moonshot um, mentality about um, investment. And you are so right about all kinds of research. If it is not steady and consistent, um, then, you know, we either um, have a brain drain, people go elsewhere, or that research app, you know, grinds to a grinds to a halt. But do tell tell me a bit about some of the things you're working on the primary and high school level. Um, that's right. also under your bailiwick too, right? Right. So at the elementary and middle school level, we're looking at not doing quantum computing per se, but quantum, uh, but computer science in general. Because in order to have a quantum computer scientist, you need a computer scientist first. And so efforts like CS for All are critical in getting computer science early because the um, 
in science anyway, if a student isn't thinking about becoming a scientist by sixth grade, they're statistically very unlikely to become a, a scientist. And so we believe the same thing may be true for computer science. So we want to have those initiatives early. On the physics side, we're looking at what are the aspects of quantum computing that are unintuitive when you get there. And one of them is this idea of measurement. Chris Monroe said that you can, all, all the operations work fine until you look at them. And it's an issue that the measurement device actually perturbs the state. For example, if you had matchbox cars, and you wanted to see how fast they were going. You could put your hand out and feel how hard it hits your hand. But now that stopped the car. And so this idea that your choice of measurement actually affects the system. And in quantum computing, you have no other choices. For a, for a car, you could video it and then calculate which one was faster. But we don't have that opportunity in quantum computing. And so those sorts of things that are very un unintuitive can become intuitive if you just give the right examples at young ages. Great. Thank you. I'm pretty much out of time. I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, the vice chairman of the subcommittee, for five minutes. Well, I thank the chairman for yielding, and thank you all for being here. I can understand about 50 percent of the things you say. So, uh, Mr. Brett, in your testimony, you state that quantum computers will allow us to solve some of the most intractable and valuable computational problems that exist. Um, can you explain to the t how doing so will benefit everyday Americans? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, there are some problems in computer science that as we add more variables to them or more factors to them, become exponentially more difficult to solve. And so that means that the time that's required to solve that problem doubles every time we add a new variable to it. And so we can reach a limit of our computational capacity to solve those kind of problems very, very quickly, even with supercomputers and the cloud computing that's available today. And so for everyday Americans, there are uh, problems like how do we optimize our financial portfolio in our 401k, that where the amount of computational work that's required to do that is already immense. But if we want to include more factors involved in that and get the most efficiency for our portfolio, the scale of computational challenge increases exponentially. And so a quantum computer can help with that. We can take on more complex and more difficult problems and solve them in a much shorter time with a, a, a new type of machine. Okay, now I'm going to be honest, Dr. Putnam, um, or Putman, I really don't know what I'm going to say here. So I'm going to say it, and hopefully you understand the question. Okay, when you measure a qubit, it immediately changes its value to either a solid one or zero. So as I understand it, which I don't, to manipulate a quantum computer the operator needs to be able to make measurements indirectly without a qubit observing you doing so. How do you do that, and how does that, how does that match the capabilities of classic electronic computers and processors with billions of transistors? This is one I, th I feel like I should have one of the <laughs> quantum computing experts um, answer. Uh, this, is, this is something that occurs in physics that has been measured for many, many years. So how it's implemented uh, becomes our greatest challenge, and there's several different ways to do it. Uh, generally, you want to be in a situation uh, where you're, you control the atmosphere. Um, it, it's, while it's observable in nature, uh, it's not as controllable as dealing with information theory, a string of zeros and ones, which just adds up and sums. Um, I think I would like to yield to somebody else who could explain the actual technology of how it might work. Uh, Dr. Monroe? Sure. Uh, first, I would, I would like to add that you're in good company because Albert Einstein uh, didn't, n he never um, accepted quantum mechanics. He didn't think it was complete. So I'm basically like Albert Einstein. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I agree. Analogies, analogies do wonders in all of science, especially in, in quantum mechanics. So I agree with Dr. Franklin's statement that finding analogies can be, you can teach the concepts to, to young young children in elementary school. I totally believe that. Here's an analogy for a qubit. It's a coin. Imagine a coin. When we flip a coin, it's in a definite state all the time, but we might not know what it is or want to know all the details. But if you think of a coin as being quantum, it's say in both heads and tails at the same time. Imagine now it's in a black box and you're not looking at it. It's so it's both heads and tails at the same time. But I want to I want to control that coin. I want to maybe flip it. Let's say it's let's say it's a weighted coin, so it's 90% heads and 10% tails. I want to flip the odds to be 90% tails and 10% heads. 
well, we can do this from the outside world by just turning the box around, hmm. in a sense. Uh, that actually kind of makes sense. So we don't know what the state was. We didn't measure it. We didn't betray the quantum system, but we've controlled it. And so to Dr. Putnam's point, this is pretty exotic hardware because the quantum stuff is inside and we have to keep our distance when we control it. We have to do things without looking and without looking at quick quotes. We're not, I mean, what it means is that the system is so extremely well, well, well isolated that we don't, we don't get the information out. So a quantum computation involves manipulations like that. They can be much more complicated. Flip one qubit depending on the state of another, for instance, without looking. And th it's possible to do that in a very small group set of technologies. And then at the end of the day, you unveil, you open the box, and you measure only one state, but it could be lots and lots of bits. And that one answer can depend on exponentially many paths, exponentially many uh, inputs in the device. And as, as uh, Mr. Brett mentioned, this can be put you to use for, for real world problems in logistics and so forth. Awesome. Well, thanks. Nice work. I yield back. There is a large statue of Albert Einstein, you know, down the street, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, down in front of the State Department. So you, you might get your statue there sometime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you very much. I'm. I, that was a good example. I'm trying to understand this and, and move it forward. This is kind of in my family. I didn't get any of the gen genetic, but I have a nephew at the University of Chicago in physics department going to Zern this summer. So he's in a different league than I am. So some of the discussion we're here is like he and my son talking to each other during Thanksgiving or whatever. He's a, he's a computer science and math person as well, working in Chicago, but in the financial industry. So I guess I'm trying to figure out the, taking the theory, or not really theory, but the things that you're talking about that it's hard to understand and make it to the real world. So um, first, Mr. Brett, i go to you. Can you tell us a little about what your company is doing in the financial services area? That's what my son's in, in algorithms. He's one of the quant guys, I guess, in, in, in uh, um, hedge funds. But how quantum computing would be an improvement over classical computing in this space? So I, what, what difference does this make, I guess? And how, what is your firm doing in financial services to be better than what's currently there? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, the financial services sector is uh, already a huge user of cloud compute technology. So they're using immense amounts of computational work either on public clouds like AWS and Microsoft or on their own private servers. And it's important to understand that quantum computers won't replace classical computers. They'll exist side by side in the cloud and quantum computers will run some of the algorithms that they're most efficient at. Mm -hmm. So in a mixed compute environment, a financial services uh, uh, company will run their daily operations around compliance, portfolio optimization, understanding risk, but send some of the algorithms that are in the program to the quantum computer to be most efficiently run. So what does that do different than what would happen? How is that? Uh, so a quantum computer can allow us to solve some particular algorithms that cannot be solved on a classical machine in a useful time frame. So we might be able to solve it over many, many years or decades even, but what if we need the answer today? A quantum computer can help give us that speed advantage and include that in the answer. So why wouldn't it completely replace the classical if it, if it gets to that? Uh, Just too expensive? Uh, so I mean, both what? too expensive and also uh, there are some problems that quantum computers can't do. So okay. uh, quantum computers aren't particularly good, for example, at addition or subtraction. So we leave those to classical computers <laughs> to do that work. And quantum computers specialize in what they're good at, which is optimization problems. Okay. So it's hard for my mental, mental capacity to understand. Something can't do math, but it can do other things. But simple math, I guess I was say. Uh, so um, so I'm, I'm an addition subtraction level. So that's, I'm, I guess I could be a class. I'm not an Einstein like my friend Mr. Kinzinger. So Dr. Putman, in, in your testimony, I'm trying to get back to reality. You identify the problem of scarcity as one that quantum computing could help solve. And how might quantum computing disrupt traditional models of how resources are created and distributed in an economy? Yeah, uh, thank you, Congressman. Often there, there is an enormous amount of waste in the way that we currently produce anything. Um, this is not due to humans caring to produce waste mm -hmm. or a problem with this in general. It's due to the ca the our inability to comprehend and to simulate and to build. Um, the more precise we are on a molecular level, the better we are at being able to do that. 
The examples that I used, such as fertilizer, for instance, or of, m of material science, a classical computer gets very rough examples of how to uh, actually build something and understand what is going on molecularly. The more we are able to do that in ways that quantum computing allows, the more we can explore the space of possibilities. When we explore that space and understand it, it gives us a chance to create it. This just is not possible with humans alone or with our classic computing systems. This applies to many areas um, in that we could go on about, okay. um, but certainly in manufacturing, it creates an entire different way of doing manufacturing when we are precise. Okay. Well, during votes in the cloakroom, I'm going to let Adam further explain this to me, so <laughs> we'll do that moving forward. Uh, thanks. I understand it. It's just such a difficult concept for people not yeah. in your space to understand, and, but it's exciting stuff. I only have about 30 seconds, but Dr. Monroe, I know Dr. Putnam mentioned about qubits, for, uh, qubits how many in, in quantum computers, but here's a question. What's the signal to noise ratio for qubits? By which I mean, how many qubits does one need for a useful quantum computer? And of those, how many would actually be performing calculations? Ah, thank you for the question. I probably won't answer it to your liking. Uh, <laughs> to my understanding, probably to my liking, just not my understanding. We don't know yet how many qubits are needed for something useful that can displace class, uh, that can displace conventional computers. However, uh, a number, a small, a relatively small number of about 75 or 100 qubits is enough to, to, to show certain very esoteric and narrow, maybe not useful problems can be solved that cannot be solved using conventional computers. That doesn't mean they're useful. And so it's sort of a proof of principle, and that's going to happen very soon. But then the question after that happens, once we're beyond that, that milepost, the, the idea is to find something useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think the only way to find something useful is to put these devices in the hands of people that don't know or care what's inside the devices, sort of like, sort of like my smartphone. I don't really want to know what's inside. Uh, and to build these devices, uh, I, I use the word exotic a lot. Uh, it is exotic hardware. To build these devices, it takes a new generation of engineers. And it may be that we need hundreds. It may be that we need thousands or more of these qubits for something useful. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for calling this important hearing. Thank you, our panelists today, for being here. Uh, from what I can tell, all of you clearly believe in the future of quantum computing. It's great. Still, there are some very smart people out there who are skeptical that quantum computing will ever become a practical reality. They say, for instance, that quantum computers are too unstable and error-prone to be harnessed for real-world problem solving. Dr. Franklin and anybody else who wants to comment on this, how do you respond to those skeptics, and what do you see as the biggest hurdles to a real-world application for quantum computing? Well, I think that if we make decisions based on that assumption, then we clearly won't build a quantum computer. And if we're, we're wrong, the stakes are far too high mm -hmm. because other countries will make one and then, um, and then th our, they will be able to decrypt all of the messages. You know, there, there, are, there are so many advantages if it can be realized mm -hmm. that we don't want to be the ones who decide early and then are wrong. Um, and we're making great strides. Uh, yes, right now, quantum computers are very small and very error prone. Um, and so physicists like Dr. Monroe are working on making them more stable, larger, longer running. Um, and then there's the piece in between. It used to be that classical computers were very large in, in size, but very few bits and couldn't, couldn't do very much. I mean, what, what we could do in the 80s in supercomputers is on your smartphone now. And so, so we don't know what can be done, and we need to put the resources in to see where we can go, because the stakes are just too high. Dr. Murrow? Uh, I, I would uh, add on to that, thank you for the question, that the same technology we use to build quantum computers is also used for quantum communication mm -hmm. and quantum sensors. And these are uh, real-world applications that are, can be and are deployed right now. Mm -hmm. On the sensor side, the ability to detect signals remotely uh, uh, via uh, optical techniques mm -hmm. or to detect mass, which means if you're underwater, you need to know mm -hmm. where you are to navigate. If you're exploring for oil, you need to know what's underneath the rock. Is it, is it oil? Is it water? Um, those sensors, the, 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 uh, the limiting signal to noise in those sensors is given by quantum, mm -hmm. quantum mechanics. And we, we can actually 
exceed those those uh, those seemingly fundamental limits in some cases. And that I mention this because that same type of technology is used in quantum computers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm not uh, I I do believe that quantum computers are the most disruptive of all these technologies. But uh, along the path toward that, there will be there will be other spin-offs. Quantum communication is largely photonics, optics, as we communicate now over long distance. You can also do this with single particles of light, photons. Mm -hmm. And photons can, th these are wonderful quantum bits that can be used for quantum computing in some, in, in some cases, but they can also be used to send, send data uh, in ways that are hack-proof. Because if somebody tries to observe it, they change it. They can cut the line always. Mm -hmm. they, c they can destroy your communication, but they can't intercept it mm -hmm. and understand it. So uh, what does that have to do with quantum computing? If you're going to build a big quantum computer, it is going to be a network. It's going to have probably optics that, that, that fiberize little modules of quantum computers. And all of this hardware, none of this hardware really exists today mm -hmm. to couple those photons to quantum memories and, and qubits. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would, I would uh, uh, hang my hat on quantum computing being the most disruptive of all of them, but along the way there are many uh, other technologies related. Dr. Franklin, you started to get into uh, something that I wanted to, to ask. I've got about a minute and 15 seconds left or so. Um, encryption and, and the applications of quantum computing to, to encryption and the potential for it to render encryption obsolete. Can you talk me through that and what's the reality of that? Yeah, so encryption is all based on the idea that doing one operation um, is much harder than undoing it. It's a lot easier to multiply two numbers than it is to divide or factor a number. And so quantum, there's a quantum computing algorithm that actually takes a lot of bits, and so that's not one of the near-term applications, um, but that makes it so that factoring the very numbers that are used to create those keys that make it, that are required to encrypt and decrypt, um, can be broken down very easily to their components, and their components are what it, are necessary to decrypt. And so if we get a quantum computer of that size, um, we're going to have to figure out new, completely new encryption algorithms that use um, mathematical functions that a quantum computer cannot do quickly. And is that time horizon, is that, can you even put a time horizon on that? Um, I do, yeah, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this factoring problem, it's among the hardest out there. You probably need tens of thousands of qubits, quanta bits, and millions or more, maybe even billions of operations. I will say, however, the problem is so important that you need to know you don't want you, you don't want a quantum computer uh, just to break messages. You you want to know when one exists. That impacts how you encrypt now, and we're talking political time scales. So if if a computer exists in 30 years, that could impact how you encrypt things now. So you may want to be ahead of the game and change the encryption standards based on when a quantum computer will exist. And it's very very hard to predict. Uh, 30 years in the future, what technology will bring us. If you can predict what's going to happen tomorrow, we'll, we should hang out more. Thanks very much. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. I don't know if this thing will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I'll be as brief as I can to get everyone else in. Uh, Mr. Brett, uh, in your testimony, you identified three classes of uh, applications that are possible. In the, uh, in the near term, and I know you talked about these uh, earlier. Can you briefly explain why you expect those to be the most possible in the near term? Thank you for the, for the question, Congressman. Um, with the earliest quantum computers, like the type that uh, Chris Munro is building at the moment, uh, the, the, the first versions of these won't have error correction on them, and so the kind of applications that we can build need to be able to accommodate errors and uh, the, the uh, potential imprecisions that come along with that. And so the kind of applications that are best suited to early stage quantum computers are those which are the most tolerant or resilient to error. And those are things like optimization problems, working with chemical simulation and uh, machine learning type problems. because the kind of algorithms we run on there are based on probabilities. And so we already get a probabilistic type answer from classical computers out of that, and a quantum computer best matches what's possible there. So the early stage applications are those that are more probabilistic, more resilient to error, uh, and then as the computers become more capable and better, we'll be able to in 
take on the, the harder uh, type problems that, that require error correction around that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is for the panel. Uh, will quantum computers be something that anyone can use, which is important, or, or will it require a highly sensitive operating environment such as that the only, uh, only a handful would be able to operate? Uh, why don't we start from over here from afar? Please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Congressman. I, it has to be something that has user uh, interfaces that are possible for everyone in order for it to be incredibly relevant. The physics and the hardware behind it, just like the hardware and the uh, physics behind everything else we do, will have s a lot of specialists involved with it. But it's important for us, it's a, a challenge and important for us that this is something that is in the hands of anybody. Uh, so I, I think absolutely. So you don't, it's not going to require uh, additional training or anything like that? It well, only to the extent that everything we do <laughs> requires some amount of training until it becomes so commonplace uh, that, that it, it becomes natural. All right. Very good. Uh, if you could uh, comment on that, please. Sure. Thank you for the question. I, I, I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I think the answer is uh, it will be very much like current computers. The use of current computers to program in certain languages takes some training. It will be a different type of a language. Uh, but the fact that there are individual atoms in the device at the end of the uh, end of the wire will be uh, lost on the user, and it should be. <laughs> they don't need to know that. Uh, they need to know the rules, uh, the programming language, and what it can solve. So I, I, I think the answer will be affirmative. Very good. Yeah, I think there are sort of three levels. One is the hardware. I mean, we're seeing quantum cloud computation, so I think it's likely that the you won't buy one and maybe have it in your pocket, but at least the cloud resources will be there. And as a user, you may not even know that you're using a quantum algorithm. The services that you use will have programmers who have made some of the quantum, have a combination of quantum algorithms and classical algorithms and send that computation to the cloud. When you do a Google search, something like 100 um, programs are spawned off for that one search to figure out, is it, an, you know, is it an airline? Is it a mathematical, you know, what all these different things. Um, in terms of the ability to program it, that's where the most work has to come in. Okay. Right now, the amount of expertise needed to program these is insane. I mean, it's, it's a high level of expertise. Okay. But that's how it was when the first women programmers were given a spec of the first computer and said, here, program this, right? They did it from the hardware. That's essentially where we are. It's very h tied to the hardware. So we need to figure out what are those abstractions that are still useful computing-wise, but also understandable to people who are the current level of a traditional computer scientist or even an application developer. Very good, please. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I fully agree with my fellow panelists that you, we believe that you shouldn't need to have a degree in quantum physics to program a quantum computer. And so that's exactly what we're doing at QBranch is building the software that enables regular software engineers and computer scientists to create applications uh, and to do so without needing to know the intricacies of what exactly is happening down at the molecular scale. Um, I'll also point out that quantum computing is already becoming accessible. So in the cloud today, um, IBM, for example, have released a quantum computer that we can all access. It's at ibm.com slash quantum. We can go there this afternoon, do a short course on quantum computing programming, and start to build up that knowledge and understanding of what's possible and uh, start to build those skills for the future. All right, very good. I, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you for continuing to put uh, before us in our hearings some very provocative thoughts and, and uh, di to this disruptive series. Uh, we've dealt with over the past two years some very curious uh, and innovative, and for me as uh, one of two engineers in Congress, uh, exciting uh, possibilities of, of where we might go with this. So I'm, I'm a little I'm fascinated with it, but I'm also, um, I, I took, well, I'm sorry that the other side of the aisle didn't show up today, um, but um, I, I was curious to hear more of what uh, Kennedy was talking about, the skepticism, because when when I looked a little into that, uh, there, there is some skepticism. And one of the, 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 the articles I was reading a couple days ago had to do with reliability of the results. The, it's, 
So I know from doing my own engineering calculation that we can, at the end of the day, we know whether that, air, that, that result makes sense. But what happens when we use a quantum computing if we get, and, and I think, Monroe, I think you might have said, if they're error prone, do we rely on the, on the result? How do we question it? If we don't, if we're relying on our computers to give us the answer, and then we get the answer, how do we know it's wrong? Or how do we know it's right? Because of all the variables that, that we've all, you've all talked about here. You want to answer that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. A very, very good one. Uh, I think it speaks to the, um, so far, the uh, limited reach of what a quantum computer is useful for. There, there exist problems, like the factoring problem. You can easily check it. 15 is equal to 5 times 3. Uh, when that 15 is a huge number, um, you can't do it using regular computers, but you can do the, you can multiply your answer together to check and see if it worked. Uh, Let's talk about encryption. Yeah, that, that uh, if you can factor large numbers, you can break the popular types of encryption algorithms out there now. And if you think you have a code breaker, you can check it quickly. And so almost all applications of quantum computers, they're either checkable against some standard or they could be better than any classical approach in, in say, for instance, in the financial market or, or some logistics problem where there's a cost function. It's in real dollars and you're trying to minimize the cost subject to an uncountable number of constraints and configurations of the marketplace, for instance. Well, if your quantum computer comes up with a, a potential uh, a, a result that has lower cost than any, any conventional computer could compute, then you found, you found a different solution. Okay, let me, let me just say a couple quick points here to follow back up. Um, I can see there's a lot more. Uh, again, fascinating. I, I, I want to see, I want to read more. This, this whole idea uh, has triggered me to, to do a little bit more research in this as well. But let's talk about the timetables. Um, right now, yes, there are some elementary units are out there. But I, I, where are we, what's the, what's the metric? Where's the goal? Where do we want to achieve? And, and how do we know that we've achieved, whether we're there? And, what is, and secondly, with that, what's the role of Congress on this? Is this just more money into research? Or is this, uh, you talked about uh, building uh, uh, plants or facilities so that we can build these qubits. Is, is this what it is? Where, where, what role is government? Well, uh, uh, thank you for the question again. I, I mentioned the, I, the, the idea of a national quantum initiative, and the crux of that initiative is to establish, indeed, a small number of hub laboratories. They're, they're not new buildings. They, These they are be, hub zones or hub labs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, quantum innovation laboratories. And they, they could be at existing university uh, Department of Energy or Department of Defense laboratories, collaborations with industry, hubs where students and industrial uh, uh, players are all in the same sandpit. And each of these hubs, there will be a small number of them, they would focus on a very particular aspect of quantum information or sensing or quantum computing, maybe develop a particular brand of qubit, for instance. And the point here is to foster the generation, a new generation of engineers in that particular technology. Industry will s be able to connect more vitally with the university and a potential workforce. Students could have internships. Are we trying to develop a standard qubit? I think it's too early to do that now. Okay. I, th I think we have several different technologies and they will probably all find different uses, sort of like now we have a CPU and a computer, we have memory, uh, we have uh, uh, FP, there are all kinds of different components, uh, different hardwares that are good for different things and we'll probably see that in quantum as well. Okay, um, again, what's the timetable? Well, I think it depends on the application. I mean, encryption might be 30 years off but okay. um, we've got 50 qubit machines now, they're growing, and so these near-term applications like optimization are, are on the horizon, maybe five years. I mean, the, the, the hardware is coming along very quickly, I think that, and, and some software, but this is the first I've heard of a software company, I'm very excited. Um, but that middleware, that there's software that needs to be created that makes it so that algorithms that assume perfect hardware can be modified to use this near-term hardware so that we don't have to wait as long and can help close that gap between the assumptions of the software and the realities of the hardware. Okay, thank you, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana for five minutes. 
Well, thank you for being here. It's a fascinating subject. I was a surgeon before, so I'm kind of a scientist, you know. And I, I'm interested in this. My daughter's a sophomore at Cornell in computer science, so she is, obviously. Um, I'm going to take a little different pathway here on questioning uh, and stay away from the technical stuff and just stay go towards um, uh, research funding. And I, I, I was on a committee before that had jurisdiction over National Science Foundation, so I'd, I'm from Indiana. I went to all the universities and talked to the NSF-funded researchers, and the one thing that I found is, first of all, I support that, right? I'm a big supporter of research. One thing I found is if I said, hey, tell me why your project, what you're doing should c get, continue to get funding from the National Science Foundation. Just a simple question, right? I found probably 90 percent of the people that I spoke to couldn't, couldn't in, a dis, in a really tight way explain that. And the, for me, they, could, you know, they can explain it in a complex way, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I get it. But people like me have to explain this to 700,000 people that we represent in a way that if we're going to justify federal dollars and taxpayer dollars, we have to be able to give so-called elevator speech and say, and one example, I think this is four or five years ago that was in kind of in the press, was about uh, a funded researcher, and this is not a criticism, uh, that was having seniors play video games. And so it got in the press, and people said, well, why would you fund that? And uh, well, as it turns out, it was Alzheimer's research. Okay, you see what I'm saying? And, uh, and very valid, very important research. But to try to explain that, you know, when, when it's written in a line, you know, government funds video game, you know, making, having people be better video game players doesn't play very well. And so people like me have a hard time explaining that. So I guess I'm, what I'm getting at is, uh, and I guess this will be primarily for the people from the universities, is what's your pitch for more funding for quantum computing. That's something, you know, I mean, I know that's a, t you've already explained it to me, and I, I get it, but if, you're, if we're going to explain it to the broader, po the broader members of Congress and our constituents, how do, we, how do we explain that, why we should do that? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, yes, I, d I, did s I did speak at length about these uh, very targeted type hubs, and it's it should be sort of self-evident what these are about. They're developing technology. They're more technology centers. But there, there must be uh, an undercurrent of foundational research, and this is something the National Science Foundation, uh, they're a very special agency in that regard. Fundamental research is very inefficient, and we can never tell what's around the corner, and uh, uh, you can never predict what's going to hit. And what Yeah, you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, that's right. And the National Science Foundation takes all comers, and mm -hmm. they they uh, will have to play an important role in a na any national quantum initiative in the future because there may be quantum technologies that don't exist now, and maybe in ten years, uh, due to some surprise in some weirdo material, we we see that oh they they behave as wonderful qubits. So we uh, again, it's it's a, it's a, it's too bad that it's inefficient, but uh, the home runs are are far reaching, and this field uh, will probably rely on those in the, in the coming decades. Dr. Franklin. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how long you're in the elevator. I think the pitch for quantum computers starts with the, the killer apps of, you know, drug design for Alzheimer's, right? 40, it's projected that 40% of the Medicaid budget is going to go towards Alzheimer's oh, yeah. by 2040. So, I mean, these are real pro and and if we could model the molecules and figure out exactly how nitrogen gets fixed, and put into fertilizer, we could have much lower energy, you know, food production. And so these are big deals, right? And those are things that can't be done with classical computing. Then the next step is you have to tie the researchers to those problems. And that's what sometimes researchers aren't good at conveying. But that's why I do think that the calls, uh, we are too, uh, we are at the cusp as commercialization, and it might be an appropriate time for even the NSF funding to be looking at the broader impacts more. You know, so, so our group is making tools that everyone can use, and so that's something that we can hang okay. on to, okay. right? The other thing I'm interested in is t technology transfer, obviously, because that is, uh, as you know, a huge problem, not only in this area, but across the research fields. And I mean, what percentage of research goes, you know, uh, that is probably potentially commercially useful that just goes into a black hole? 
and I know I'm short on time, but maybe, maybe, uh, Mr. Brett, you could comment. I mean, how how we can do better on uh, on technology transfer because it's a it's a pretty big problem, really. Yeah, thank you, Congressman, and we we agree. As a small business that is looking to commercialize some of these innovations, how do we get access to some of the great work that's being done at the universities and to incorporate? Because it's them? proprietary, right? Sometimes that's some, some of the problem, maybe, right? People are willing if they if they put their research out there, they're willing. They're worried somebody will steal it, so to speak, right? And we found um, an approach that's been particularly successful for us is being able to partner with universities on research grants, and so for uh, as a R and D business to also participate in the collaboration of that research and contribute to the science and the publication around that, and share some of that intellectual property on a on a joint project together. And I think that that cross between the commercial sector and the research sector working together on funded proposals will enable a, a lot of that technology transfer. Okay, my time's up. I yield back. Well, the gentleman yields back, and uh, I, I first I want to thank our, our panel for being here today. One of the great things about serving on this committee, and uh, because we do have this wide jurisdiction, I always say it's like looking over you know, over the horizon five to ten years that we hear it here first. And uh, we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, our nation is on that cutting edge. And I'm, I'm going to say something about some of our folks that were asking questions. They're a little bit on the modest side. I have a former Air Force pilot, a West Point grad, an engineer, and a cardiothoracic surgeon over here. So they're, they're, they, uh, they're, they're not limited in knowledge. <laughs> But, but what you gave us today was uh, very, uh, very, very informative because, again, we have to uh, make sure that as we go forward as a committee that we are making the right decisions as we, as we go on. And I'm sorry. Pardon? Yeah, and uh, if I have the general lady also would like to make a comment too. So I just want to uh, thank you all, but I'll, make, I'll fi finish up the, uh, the ending, but I'll let the general lady right now. Thank you. Um, China is, uh, is building a $10 billion quantum lab right now, um, and, by, and they, they expect to be finished by 2020. And the EU is investing about $2 billion in advanced quantum technology. So I think one of the answers is, in terms of why we should be serious about making investments, um, maybe decryption is uh, and encryption is um, some decades uh, away, but from a national security perspective, um, I think that there are a lot of reasons that we should uh, take this seriously, make the investments. And, and of course, all the practical things about um, agriculture and pharmaceuticals, et cetera, is very, very important, um, disease um, cures. Um, but um, it's, it seems to me that despite maybe some skepticism, there's enough evidence right now that this is an, really ought to be an important priority. So I just want to thank you very much. You really did enlighten me. Thank you. Thank you, General Lady Yields back. And seeing that we have no further members that are going to be asking questions today, uh, pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask that witnesses submit their response within 10 business days upon receipt of questions. And without objection, the subcommittee will stand adjourned. Thank you very much for attending today.